Good afternoon and welcome to our webcast, the Scottish Marine Recreation and Tourism Survey, which was published recently, was designed, or at least the thinking behind it, was all about looking at where people use Scotland's coasts and seas and producing maps that would help with planning for the future. I'm Ian Forsyth and with me today I've got a couple of the people who have been heavily involved in producing that survey and we'll be asking some questions of them shortly. But before we do that, we've got a little pre-record here that we're going to let you watch because it will set the scene and give you a little bit of the background to the survey. Everyone involved in marine tourism and recreation in Scotland has long identified a need to better understand where and how people use the Scottish seas and coastline for fun. In 2015, the Scottish National Marine Plan was published and the Marine Recreation Chapter formally recognised this gap in information. The new breed of marine planners were thirsty for data. Who is taking to the coast and sea for recreation? Where are they going? For how long? How do they get there and what facilities do they need? Even though the team was focused on finding out where and when people used the sea, they didn't want to miss the chance to find out more about how much it means to the Scottish economy. And so it was that the Firth of Clyde Forum, an organisation devoted to all things marine and coastal, together with LUC Consultancy, began work on a project funded by the Scottish Government, the Crown Estate and the Scottish Coastal Forum, with the aim of gathering enough information to try to answer some of these questions. Following diligent work by the whole team, the almost 400 page final report, along with more than 25 maps and a full review of all the associated literature has been published. In all, 23 activities were measured and with two and a half thousand responses and more than 52,000 data points submitted, this was by far and away the largest ever survey of its kind. Headline figures are impressive. The final estimate is that the sector is worth around £3.7 billion. That breaks down to £2.4 billion for general recreation and tourism and £1.3 billion for specialist activities such as sailing, kayaking or surfing. In addition to the response from the public, almost 300 businesses also responded to the survey and they told us that they're hopeful about the growth of the sector. Armed with the information in the survey, they can see where their customers' interests lie and they can deliver recreation and tourism services better than ever before. For the first time, we also have an idea how important the stunning scenery and wildlife of Scotland is to this group of people. And respondents have told us they understand the need to protect it. They've also told us how much they value practical things like parking and a good cup of coffee or tea as well. It was not easy for individuals and businesses to give up their time to provide this information and the collaboration and support they gave the project had a lot to do with its success. The team would like to thank everyone who completed the survey and all their partners for their time and support. But enough from me. Over to the studio and the team who ran the project. They're ready to take your questions. So as Nikki said there, 52,000 data points, 2,500 responses, 400 pages, 25 maps, very impressive statistics, but we want to go behind the statistics and today we've got Sarah Brown of Clyde Marine Planning Partnership, I had to make sure I got the name just right there, Absolutely. and we've also got Nick James of LUC who was a senior consultant involved in, in actually managing and conducting the survey. But before I go over to Nick and Sarah, if I can just remind you, and some people have already started, which is great. I've got some questions here, but we really want your questions as well. You'll notice on the right hand side of the video window that you're watching me in at the moment, there's a little discussion box. You can chat to other people on the webcast via that discussion box, but you can also send us your questions and we'll get them through here and we'll ask Nick and Sarah to give us answers to your questions. So we really want those questions from you over the next 45 minutes. So make sure you get them in quick because we may run out of time and not be able to cover all of them. Uh, so that's the little tip, get that question typed in, hit enter and we'll do our best to cover as many as we can over the next 45 minutes. But let's move over and look at the thinking first of all behind why the survey was conducted. I mean, maybe start with you Sarah. Why did you decide to go down the route of an online survey in particular for this exercise? Um, 
When we first started working with LUC to, to pull the survey together, we spent a lot of time trying to work out what methodology we might use. We talked about walking down beaches with clipboards, we talked about uh, the possibility of using a postal survey, we, talked, we even talked about phoning everybody in Scotland and asking them exactly what they did with their weekends. And in the end it, it sort of boiled down to the fact that the need in the National Marine Plan was for mapped outputs. So we needed to know, we wanted maps where we could see where people were going. And the very best way of doing that was with an online survey. And so it was just, it was a, a practical whittling down of the options really, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the most effective way of getting to a large number of people um, and doing that in a fairly unbiased way. Right. So, I mean, if you look at how representative then that the sample was on the basis of that, how, how did you manage to achieve that? Yeah, I, mean, I think first of all we were really pleased with the, the number of responses we got. I think it was about two and a half thousand if you include the business survey and... Thanks everybody. Yeah, fantastic response. <laughs> um, to benchmark that, compare it with the previous survey ten years ago and that was I think 400 responses yeah. and 12 businesses. Mm -hmm. So, really, really good response. Um, I think we we're aware that whatever method we used, there would be some degree of bias within that unless you're able to speak to everybody in Scotland and clearly that wasn't going to be possible. So the kind of methods that Sarah talked about, standing on our beach asking people questions, the kind of places they would tell us about were the mm -hmm. places we'd survey them from. So we wouldn't get an unbiased view across yeah. the whole of Scotland. Right. Right. So the method we used to go out through networks, people involved in different recreation activities, meant we'd reach the maximum number of people. Um, and get engaged people responding to us. The flip side of that is we have to be aware that um, they're not typical necessarily of the whole population. So uh, we're aware from looking at the data we've got a slightly older population, uh, more likely to be male and probably more affluent than the Scottish population. We don't know how that compares with everybody taking recreation at the coast, but it's something we need to be aware of. Um, so partly because of that, um, we carried out a series of workshops at the end of mm. the work, mm -hmm. really just to sort of do a bit of ground truth in and to check that the results we'd got made sense. They yeah. made sense to us, but we wanted to check on the ground that they did. And that was really useful. Um, we had you know, kayakers turning up saying, yeah, that's broadly where I go, that's where my mates go, that's broadly how much I spend, it's, it's not looking stupid. Um, equally, we had a, a workshop in Shetland and that was really helpful because it highlighted that some organisations hadn't been aware of the survey. Yeah. Um, highlighted the fact that from year to year patterns of activity change according to the weather or different events. Yeah. So you know, that was really helpful to help us tune, condition and sort of understand our results. But I think overall, um, really pleased with the results that came out. We need to qualify a few of them, how mm -hmm. they're used. Um, mm -hmm. But particularly the spatial stuff, it's very, very rich, very good data. Yeah. Right. Okay. I mean, d in terms of your expectations at the start of the exercise, with the level of response, what you expected, or does it exceed oh, it that? Oh, it exceeded it. I mean, I, I was, I was hoping that we would, quietly confident that we would hit a thousand, mm -hmm. and then I, I sort of hoped we might get fifteen hundred, and then whenever we started going past that, we got two thousand, then it crept creeping up and up and up absolutely delighted and and the people who've the kind of the, the Scottish government people the marine analytical unit who've been receiving this work on the on the government side of things have actually described it and I, I think we can blow our own trumpets here and say that they have described it as gold dust you know this is really great stuff it's, it's really um, rich data sources that is going to stand us in good stead for years to come really yeah. is good. I think there's a real lesson here in the way that the project was set up in a way because um, we had a group of people, a group of organisations who kind of helped steer yeah. the project right. and it covered right across the sector and as consultants we were kind of slightly nervous about this because the list of questions we wanted to answer was very long yeah. but in fact getting the message out, publicising the project, getting you know, prize draw gifts, all those kind of things into the project was fantastic and we were able to publicise it through all these different channels which meant we got a much higher response rate than right. we might otherwise right. have done. Right. So. Yeah, really, really good partnership project, yeah, I think. Yeah, absolutely. It says a lot about the marine tourism recreation in Scotland that there is that network and you can reach so many people. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. yes, it's dispersed and yes, people are out there doing their own individual things, but they do kind of coalesce around these organisations and, you know, they're generally one person will be interested in several different activities and certainly that's what we saw in the responses to the, the questionnaire but uh, you can still get to those people reasonably right. easily. Yeah. 
I mean, looking looking at the results, I mean, one of the things that Nikki mentioned uh, in the, the pre-record there was the the twenty five maps. What what do they show? What what's that all about? We started off by thinking about uh, which activities we wanted information on, um, and you could have a very very long list of different activities that occur, recreation and tourism activities that occur around the coast and at sea. Um, so we, uh, with our steering group, kind of whittled that down to. I think it was 22 in the end. Yeah, we should say that those that list was was devised from Scottish Natural Heritage's lists from Marine Management Organisation south of the border, the MCA, BMF, RYA, Omnibus Survey list, Office for National Statistics. We were trying very hard to come up at the end of the day with something that can be compared to other lists. Right. So we weren't sitting there going, what do people do at the coast? We were actually sitting with a, a set of lists from other people. Absolutely, yeah. yes. And we had one other category. We allowed people to yeah. put other. And interestingly, almost everybody who responded to that highlighted wildfowling as being an activity. So we've right. in fact got 23 activities. One of them is an additional one that people nominated themselves. Right. So for each of those, we've got a map that shows um, in quite a colourful way where people do these different activities uh, and that provides a really good sort of spatial picture across the whole of Scotland for the, the hot spots, the, the cooler spots mm -hmm. um, for all those different activities. Were there any surprises in that for you in terms of where the hot spots were? <laughs> well, I, there was one surprise for me. <laughs> that whoever's out there, if, if you're watching, if you could let me know what that Bermuda Triangle is out near Barra, that would be great, because there, there, was, there was two things that were really surprising. That I think they're probably anomalies, but, <laughs> but somebody who put in a, a triangle outside Barra, right. or around that, that sea area, on several different activities, and somebody else apparently goes sand yachting in the Sound of Mull. Right. Now, anybody who knows the Sound of Mull, knows it's, it's a little bit lacking in sand. <laughs> Plenty of wind, but not so much sand. But I mean, there were, there were other surprises as well. Yeah, I think there were real insights. So things like um, bird and wildlife watching, yeah. uh -huh. real focus on the west coast, particularly around Mull. And I kind of guess that reflects yeah. some of the activity there, that there's been there around sea eagles and the kind of promotion of that and the tourism link. Right. But also con on the east coast, the Murray Firth really lit up as well for the wildlife watching yeah. the, the dolphins. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, other things like uh, long distance walking, a real concentration on the east coast where there's a good mm -hmm. network of uh, paths along the, the coastal area. And in the west it's much harder to do that. So, right. Um, and also some just, just some maps which really confirmed what you thought you knew but right. provided yeah. more detail. So your windsurfing Tyree jumped out like a bright beacon. Uh -huh. um, scuba diving you've got the, the sound of mole uh, and scapa flow where of course there's the German yeah. fleet. So yeah those things really kind of confirmed, and I guess gave us a bit of confidence as well about the results that were coming out. Right. Yeah, so. absolutely, and, and new developments like Loch Maddy from the sailing perspective. You know, that's quite a, a recently opened and yeah. advertised facility for boaters. And yeah. you could see the line of people going across to this quite new area. And I bet you if you'd done the same survey sort of two or three years previously, right, yeah. you probably wouldn't have seen that be nothing there. desire line going yeah. across, you know. Yeah. I've our first workshop um, after the survey was in, in Stornoway mm -hmm. and we had the guys there from the council who'd obviously been promoting the investment of Loch Maddy and Loch Boysdale and they were just delighted to see those lines of people sailing to those yeah. points. Right. And to me that suddenly made me think, yeah, this is actually really valuable information yeah. supporting investment in infrastructure as well as promotion of the activities. So right. Yeah, right. all these different uses, really, really good. Absolutely. Yeah. And I assume even where it is just a case of confirming what you thought you already know, essentially that's taking that assumption and guesswork out of it then, isn't it? Well, it's fine for us to assume. Mm. That we, we know, because we're working in the marine environment, you know, as a marine right. planner myself, and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the team that we worked with now, you see, we're all um, in marine enthusiasts in one way or another, kayakers or sailors or whatever. So we have our assumptions and our knowledge of the sea, but not everybody is into boating. You know, yeah. Not everybody is out there kind of enjoying the sea, but they may still have an influence on it, they may be setting policies about it, they may be sitting at their desks wondering how the marine environment is used. And now we've actually got a report where we can say, this is how it's used, this is where people go, this right. is a piece of coastline you're not familiar with and these are the hot spots, you know. Uh -huh. and it, it's, I do want to emphasise it's a starting point for planners, isn't it? It's not, 
It's not here is chapter and verse. Yeah. This is just a really good starting point and there will be a lot more focused work, I'm sure, done in the regions, the marine regions, mm -hmm. and to kind of tease out detail that, that's going to be even more useful. Right, and that can be used to build on, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, th I think the other thing to add is that um, while we as, as kind of participants and professionals could have highlighted the, the hot spots, yeah. mm -hmm. we might have struggled to identify the areas where activity takes place to some degree, but not massively. Right. Yeah. So this is providing the, the grain, the, the, the kind of the comprehensive coverage of the Scottish coastline yeah. which right. is always difficult to get yeah so the hot spots are almost obvious it's the yeah it's, it's the other bits yeah. of information which, which are probably more important in some ways right okay um, we obviously recognize that um, some of the less visited areas like the outer isles the west niles and perhaps some of the activities we have fewer participants our information is is perhaps thinner mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's indicative um, but I, that's why I sort of echo what Sarah said about this being the starting point yeah you know? There's, there's a need for more work, ongoing work, repeat surveys and so on, I think. Okay. We've got a couple of questions from the audience, so if we just move over and take, take a couple of those just now, and then we'll come yeah. back to some of the things that we, we, we said we would, we would cover. Um, we've got a question from Bob, who's based in Sandhaven in Aberdeenshire. It's quite a long question, so I will read the whole thing out just to make sure I don't get any of the emphasis wrong. When will the Murray Firth and East Coast small harbours such as Sandhaven near Fraserburgh be given serious recognition as a viable seaborne tourist resource? This is particularly with regard to Scandinavian and Baltic sea traffic and financial assistance to such harbours. So, you know, Bob's always got to think about the, the, the harbours there in, in Aberdeenshire. Yeah, Bob, that's, that's a really good question. And I think that uh, it falls slightly outside the scope of, of this work. But I would say that the Marine Tourism Development Group and the Marine Tourism Strategy Awakening the Giant looks a lot at sailing tourism. And in particular, they're looking at the, the emerging markets over in the Baltic and how we can attract uh, sailing traffic in particular, boating traffic, down across to the East Coast and then sort of filter through um, and in and around Scotland. So I would say that the East Coast ports are being taken seriously and it is definitely something that, that people are looking at on a strategic level. This evidence base is really going to help those investment decisions to be made. And uh, if you wanted some more information about the Marine Tourism Development Group, um, I would probably get in contact with Stephen Dot from Highlands and Islands Enterprise. So Stephen, sorry for dropping you in there, but I'm sure you'd be able to help Bob out with, with some more contacts. Okay, that's great. It's always, it's always good to be able to point someone <laughs> yeah, in a absolutely. specific direction, absolutely. isn't it? Excellent. Yeah. Um, we've got another one from Donald, who's based in, in Helensburg. Uh, and Donald has brought up the point about major events like regattas and championships uh, that are typically run by clubs. And he's asking the question, how well do you think you're engaging with the clubs and the voluntary sector on which such events rely? Gosh, I would. I mean, I would love to be able to say that that this survey captured a lot of the, that club data and and was able to quantify all the economic impact of those sorts of events. That did again fall outside of our remit. But I know that the Scottish Sailing Institute, for example, um, does collect economic data on some of the larger regattas that they organise, and that gets fed through into uh, the again the Scottish Marine Tourism Strategy. Um, and I think that more and more our way Scotland is gathering that sort of demographic and economic impact information. So behind the scenes we are all working really hard to get a picture of what those events actually mean to local communities, to the voluntary sector, to, uh, to marine planners like myself. That what can we do to help support that infrastructure to, to develop? Um, so it's a, it's a work in progress but we are working at it and very much aware of it and I would definitely say RA Scotland is the best place to have that discussion and see how that information can be collected on a, a more kind of comprehensive across the board basis because um, it would be really really helpful to get a grasp of the economics of those sorts of events. Okay. Um, we've got more questions coming in from the audience, but I am very, very conscious there's one thing in particular that we had talked about before we went on air, and, th and that's this figure of £3.7 billion that was generated by the survey. How was that calculated and, and how confident are you with that? I think this is definitely one for you, Nick. You're nodding. Which yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we always wanted to try and get an idea of how much um, the sector, all these different activities were contributing to the Scottish economy. Um, 
and recognise that happens in two ways. One is, well, three ways, I suppose. Uh, firstly, in terms of how much people spend when they're doing their activity. Secondly, how much they spend over the course of a year on kit, on boats, or mm -hmm. those kind of things. Uh, and thirdly, the businesses that support that and the employment that comes from it. Um, the 3.7 billion figure focuses on one part of that, purely on the, the money that's spent um, during a trip. Right. Now, the way we went around trying to calculate an overall figure for that was to uh, take two other surveys um, and use that to size the overall population, I suppose. So um, Scottish Natural Heritage runs something called the, the Scottish People and Nature Survey, mm -hmm. um, which gives an idea of the total number of people who take part in lots of different types of recreation, including going to the coast. Right. And that gave us an idea about the total number. Um, using that information plus some information from um, British Marines a survey of uh, water sports participation. We were able to break that figure down into different activities. Right. And then we were able to bring our own information from the survey on how much people would typically spend per trip right. um, by those different activities. And that allowed us to sort of calculate up in terms of what the overall spend yep. pattern was, which came out at 3.7 billion. Now, going back to the earlier question about the, um, the, the representativeness of the sample, we have a suspicion that some of the figures, spend figures, were probably a little bit high because the people we're speaking to were more active and more enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. We don't know that for sure. Some activities might be a bit lower. Yeah. Um, think about a really keen kayaker will probably just head out to sea, <laughs> camp, come back in, whereas um, somebody who's less enthusiastic might go to the cafe and spend half the day recovering afterwards. So we don't really, we have a fairly good idea, and we're, we're pretty confident about the figures yeah. that we, we got for each activity, right. um, which allows us then to gross up, as I say, to the 3.7 billion. Within that, the largest share, well over two, 2 billion, is accounted for by general recreation. So that's people going to the beach, muck around, kick a ball about, go for a short walk, mm -hmm. go for a short swim in the sea, those kind of things, um, which accounts for the vast amount of activity in Scotland. But I think you can kind of pull out different groupings. So we've looked at all of the, the boat-based activities, for example, and that comes to about £230 million pounds a year. Um, various different kind of cuts, and I, I think that's quite a useful approach because people can then sort of add things up their own way. Um, to check, because we, we, this 3.7 billion figure was, was quite interesting to us, but we wanted to check it made sense. Mm -hmm. So. We did a lot of benchmarking against you know, the size of the Scottish economy, um, how much money is typically spent um, on overnight stays in Scotland, how big the marine economy is. Um, there was one specific thing that Scottish Enterprise did in 2010 around yeah. sail the sailing economy, mm -hmm. and that came out within around £200,000 of the figure that we generated. Yeah. So, quite know, confident at that point. We're, we're quite, co yeah. quite confident that those, those figures make sense. They're in the right ballpark right. Uh, and are useful in terms of highlighting how important the sector is to the Scottish economy. I think we should emphasise that this is this is coastal and marine tourism. So this is you know this is bus tours coming to the coast, this is people walking along the promenade as right. well as the specific activities of kayaking or right. kite surfing yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So w if you look at the final report you'll see that there yeah there is that headline figure it does break down and you are looking at there's the coastal tourism aspect there is mm -hmm. the specific af activities and then you can break those activities down into even finer grain detail right okay there was a business aspect to the survey yeah. we've already learned from nick that if you run a cafe you probably want to target less enthusiastic kayakers <laughs> <laughs> they're the only ones that come to the enthusiastic ones really hungry well. <laughs> well that's true yes yeah <laughs> But looking at the business side, what are the, the kind of biggest challenges facing businesses in relation to, to the survey? Uh, I mean, one of the surprises from, from my perspective looking at the responses to the business survey was how optimistic businesses were about the future. You know, and they were saying in the next five years they're planning to grow. But in the same breath, they were saying to us that they got some really well defined skills challenges. And they're not only skills in terms of um, what we might think of as the softer skills of customer service and you know the, the kind of uh, meet and greet type things. Mm -hmm. Those are definite needs within the, the, the whole sector. 
but there's also a kind of aging demographic of the, the, the guys working in boat yards effectively. We need more marine engineers, we need more people who can work with boats, we need more boat builders, we need uh, people who understand marine engines. And a lot of those skills are transferable across from, you know, a, a mechanic in a, in a, a car workshop mm -hmm. could also transfer those skills across to marine engineering. So we're having some really interesting discussions with Skills Development Scotland on the back of this survey already, looking at how uh, Skills Development Scotland, SDS, can kind of sort of re-emphasise their, their strategy slightly. They're just renewing their strategy at the moment to help that transfer of skills from the terrestrial environment into the marine environment so that we can sort of start to fill that skills gap. So already we're starting to see the effect of this report, you know, actually biting in and having having an impact. Right. I didn't realise that terrestrial was the opposite of marine. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I've, learned, I've learned something that's There's really, terrestrial really people with their bunny boots. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a few more questions coming in yep. from the audience, so I think it would be good to, to, to go back to these. We've got one from Paul, who's based in Aberdeen. Uh, he's involved in Dundee's marina development as the project manager for Dundee Waterfront, and he's interested to hear how you, your thoughts on the development, its location on the East Coast, and any suggestions you have to ensure its success. So he's not looking for much, obviously, but just <laughs> no, a, tips on how to make it all work. Tips how to make it work. Um, uh, Paul, I have to say that there have been a number of uh, events I've been asked to, to attend recently, and they, they seem to be in Dundee, 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 and Dundee. So you, I think you're doing pretty well in marketing Dundee as a, as a, uh, a destination. Um, how to get the best from it, I think. Uh, look at Titanic Quarter in Belfast and see what they've done. Um, speak to people on a scale that's appropriate to you and, f and less and learn from them. Um, I'm not the expert in, in that sort of large scale development. You're doing a, a fabulous job. Um, keep up the good work and, and talk to your peers and, and less and learn. Mm. See, just before you, you, you come in there, Nick, there's a bit of a follow up from Paul. So if I just put that in just now as well. What can Dundee oblique the East Coast do to increase international marina visitors? So that might be something you want to add into your response. I was going to talk about linking East and West Coasts because right. yeah. um, our map showed a lot of activity in the West Coast. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there probably is more in the East than we captured, particularly the international stuff, so that's, that's a relevant point. Um, but I think it, our work also showed that two of the, um, the big canals, so the Crinan Canal mm -hmm. and the Caledonian Canal, were really well used, sort of linking up bits of sea. But the Forth and Clyde Canal was less used, so yeah. maybe there's an opportunity there to sort of think about how the West Coast activity could link through Absolutely. to the East Coast, yeah. and yeah. rather than getting people to go all around the top, which is obviously a bit hairy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or can be. And I would say, I mean, the, the <clears throat> one of the things I think throughout Scotland we could probably all learn, and, and one of the things that we're talking about within uh, the, the policy and strategy behind this work he said there's a need for different ports and harbours to work with each other and yep. create this sort of necklace effect where people are pulled from one venue to the next and encouraged to go around and that any fears are taken out of it maybe by using the the Forth and Clyde Canal or maybe by local knowledge helping people with um, kind of getting around headlands and things like that or transport connections that kind of let me take your boat out the water in the Cal of Loch Alsh and put you back in the water over in, in Inverness for example they're, they're, you know yeah. those sort of transport options for people but there's L lots and lots, and we've seen this happen in the Clyde and, and in various other places, lots of benefit to be gained from talking to your neighbours um, uh, doing similar businesses to you. So the, talk to the harbours above and below you and, mm -hmm. and uh, in your network and come up with a plan that's going to benefit all your businesses. Okay. Because the, you know, they're not in competition with you, they mm -hmm. are working together. We've, it's been proven to be a much stronger uh, business approach you know okay well if I can just throw something in here on mm. the basis of, of the webcast today obviously there are people because we're going to go on to a question from someone from Greenock so we just moved across the country to the west coast if there are bits of information you want to share or you want to find out or make connections with people use the discussion box put in what you want to find out from other people and perhaps you'll get a response from them because this is an opportunity yeah as I say we're now going to move to a question from uh, Martin who's based in Greenock and he's asking about the 1.3 billion that's attributed to marine tourism and how it breaks down because it doesn't seem to agree with those released by other bodies he's saying 
This is the, the, the part of the um, analysis relating to more specialist activities. So yeah. it's things like the kayakers, the windsurfers, the sailors, the motor cruisers, those kind of things. Um, and the benchmark figure we looked at, well, as I mentioned earlier on, was in relation to sailing, and we, we yeah. did feel there was quite a good Absolutely. link across there. Yeah. Well, yeah, so when, when we, we looked at that, uh, the 1.3, and looked at the different activities, when you look at the body of evidence that we were, we were working from, so we did a full literature review to start with, and that, mm -hmm. that actually took up a, a much bigger chunk of time than, than we thought, because there's actually quite a rich body of evidence out there. The only problem was that sailing tourism was the only, sailing and angling were the only two mm. really that had come up with a quantifiable, this is what our sector we think is worth. So when we'd done our sums, well, when, when Nick had done our sums, <laughs> um, we went back to those, um, those benchmarks and said, right, how do our sums reflect with these ones? And I think that we came up, I think the, the sailing tourism in Scotland in 2010, um, done by Scottish Enterprise, came up with 101 million, mm -hmm. and I think we came up with 98 million. 98 million, million yes. Yeah. yeah. And so. then whenever the the next stage of the sailing tourism in Scotland, they said, well, what's the added value? They came up with 300 million, and I think we came up with 230 million, was the, was the added value part mm -hmm. of it. And those sorts of numbers gave us quite a lot of confidence that we think that we're along the right track. But there, there aren't any other figures that disagree with our figures in a substantive sort of way. Right, so you're relative, it goes back to the confidence that you expressed earlier on. I think, I think we're, we're, we're reasonably confident about the results. Obviously, every survey that's carried out uses a different methodology and yeah. will come up with a slightly different figure. But mm -hmm. um, this is the, f the first time I'm aware of that it's been done across the board for lots yeah. of different activities. Yeah. So it's, it's all comparable and comparable. Okay, just go back to the business aspect for a second. We kind of touched on this, but ju just to make sure it's totally clear, what do you think are the key aspects that businesses need to focus on as a result of the outcomes of the survey? I think we're seeing um, this more strategic approach, right? And th and the need for businesses. Businesses across Scotland, in my experience, and, and this is a bit anecdotal, but it's supported by the evidence, in my experience, are, are, they're responding to customer demand and they're becoming more and more professional, if you know what I mean. It's uh, uh, not to say that they, they weren't professional before, but you know, they, there's that polish that's coming onto um, marine businesses across the board in Scotland. And customers are demanding it more and more. They're demanding an international experience and something that they, they can kind of um, really get value for money from as well. And that is really evidenced in the survey. And, and the survey is saying to those businesses, value the wildlife al asset, and value the scenery that's around you. We can take it for granted. You know, on the West Coast, uh, well, the whole of Scotland is stunningly beautiful. We have the best sailing. We have the best wildlife. I am not biased. That is the truth. <laughs> Um, and I think we need to really value that in the way that our customers are valuing it. When you look at the survey, uh, people undertaking marine tourism and recreation activities are saying, we love the scenery, we love the wildlife, we think this is a really special place. Yes, we want facilities mm -hmm. in order to help us to, to do that. And I think we need to respond to that customer demand, help them explore the wildlife, help them understand and enjoy the scenery. Um, yes, there's wet weather options we need to give them and midgy spray and all that sort of stuff. But I think there's a great business opportunity for, for marine businesses out there to, to kind of grasp that and really make the most of it. I think this is fantastic intelligence for the sector in a way. Yeah. Um, those maps will show businesses where people go Yep. which activities they undertake, why they go there, all those kind of things. Which how much they're spending. How much they're spending, really valuable stuff. The other thing we haven't touched upon is we ask specific questions of, of visitors to Scotland, so mm -hmm. people who are coming from the rest of yeah. the UK or from overseas. Yeah. And the results of that were really stunning, that really high level of approval, uh, return rates, um, yeah. really, really, really positive stuff. So again, this should give, I, I think, confidence to the sector. and help you know, b bs hotels, restaurants, all those different providers who may not immediately see themselves as being linked to the marine coastal environment, mm -hmm. um, that actually you know, there's a real good source of demand there. Uh, and as Sarah said, some of, the, some of the qualities that Scotland can offer yeah. are yeah. things that other parts of the UK, other parts of it's world class. Europe haven't got. Do you have a feel for what's behind that, those high levels of approval that you referred to there? 
I imagine it's a combination of things. That's, that's a question we didn't ask, but, right. I, mm. but I think the fact that the environmental qualities, the facilities, those kind of things came out over and over again as being really key to why people go to different places, yeah. um, right. different parts of the coast, uh, okay. will underline that, I'm sure. Okay, so it wasn't the exploding jellyfish, was that what we were talking about? <laughs> I had to get a question. Well, we, we agreed we weren't going to talk about the exploding jellyfish. No, we jellyfish. have to talk about exploding Honestly. jellyfish. We can. We were talking about it before we went on here. You have to explain to people exploding jellyfish. What that exploding happened. populations of jellyfish was what I meant to say. <laughs> but since we were on the wildlife bit, I thought we really needed to make sure the audience heard There are about no exploding it. jellyfish out there. Okay. Please don't, don't start running out. <laughs> so we can dispel that myth dispel completely myth, yeah. and move swiftly Set the on. jellyfish to Move outside. swiftly on. <laughs> We've got a question from, from John who's based in Stirling, um, which is probably a kind of terrestrial location, really, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much. Just on the cusp, actually. Yeah. 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 Um, and he is interested in knowing that about now that the survey has been published, mm. what's the next step and what's it primarily going to be used for? John, did you say? Yes. Yeah. So, hi, John. Um, this, I'm delighted to say, is not going to be a survey that's going to sit on a shelf and just gather dust. Um, we're already in the in the Clyde Marine Planning Partnership. So, we last year we were a Firth of Clyde Forum, and we are now the Clyde Marine Planning Partnership. We're going ahead to do marine planning, as is Shetland, on the basis of the National Marine Plan and, and the Marine Act in Scotland. And we've already um, taken the report, and uh, we have extracted the Clyde-specific data and we're already using that for the assessment of the Firth of Clyde so that we can start to build policies on the basis of, of that information. So all around the coast of Scotland, people in, in my sort of, of shoes will be looking at this data and saying, right, how do we use this to um, for local coastal development plans, local development plans, um, coastal infrastructure, investment, um, you've got the Scottish Marine Tourism Development Group are looking at this data and saying, right, how does this influence our strategy going forward, if we were to, to refresh our strategy, what might we do differently or how would we utilise this? I know the Scottish Government is also looking at it in terms of their investment strategy. Um, then kind of going on to, um, uh, my, my phone keeps ringing with people saying, um, I want to put in a, an application for funding. Um, can you direct me to the part of the, of the report that's going to help me with that? So people are using it for that as well. So. There's, there's community groups out there using it as an evidence base to show funders that their area uh, is either being used or could be used if a facility was there for people to, to actually utilise. So from marine planners to community groups to policy makers um, through to actually researchers as well. We've got universities, several universities are now coming <coughs> to us and saying uh, we want to know more and do more with this data. So. I'm delighted to say, as a piece of work that I've been involved with, I'm, it's not going to sit on a shelf and uh, just gather dust. Yeah. Yep. I mean, what, what would you add to that, Nick, in terms of having been involved in the survey? What do you see as the, as the opportunities for people to use? Apart from taking a good long holiday now. <laughs> <laughs> if only. <laughs> no, I, I, I just echo what, what Sarah said, I think. And um, the workshops you ran after the, the survey was completed really had people saying, yeah, we could use this for you know, developing a marketing strategy for yeah. an activity or an area. Um, different, yeah. different user groups, so uh, perhaps a, a walking group might suddenly see their area is really, really popular for that. So mm -hmm. how do you develop that? What infrastructure do you need to support that? So I think at the beginning, I thought it was all about marine planning, but I think, in fact, there are many yeah. other ways. Um, at communities, at user groups, for private investors, um, yeah, businesses can use this, as I said earlier on, as really powerful evidence base to inform where they put their money, how they invest, how they develop, how they market themselves. Okay. Um, so yeah, and it's a starting point, I think, for more detailed research. This is a high-level survey of the whole yeah. of Scotland in one go. Right. Um, really to support more detailed stuff by activity or by area. That'd be great. If anybody's out there would like to fund that work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, never, never a mess. I'm sure you find somebody who'd want to do it. <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> we're we're getting close to running out of time. There's a couple of questions still to come in from the audience here. Um, Christine, who's based in Eastern Bartonshire, is interested in knowing the feeling among boaters about the standard and cost of navigating the Forth and Clyde Canal. Any thoughts on that one, or is that a little off? 
Um, as Scottish Canals have done an awful lot of work on um, kind of the customer response to, to the, the canals. What we can tell you from this report is that they're definitely being used and they're being used a lot. Um, I, I couldn't really comment on, on anything further than that, unfortunately. I don't think we, no, we, did we, didn't, we didn't collect that sort of... No, we, we, we collected information on which canals were used. Um, how frequently, but yeah. we didn't ask the, the, the more detailed questions. That's the kind of yeah. follow-up question that yeah, there, there's an opportunity to do, I think. Yeah. Richard Miller <laughs> sits on the uh, Scottish Marine Tourism and Development Group. He may or may not be watching, um, and he would be a good person to ask that question of. He's from the Scottish, Cana Scottish Canals. Okay. Tongue twister. So that's the person to... That's the person to, to ask yeah. that question of. Excellent, great. So, uh, we've got a question from Sky here, and I'll, I'll just paragraph it. It's about community organisations uh, having sustainable coastal development projects on shore. They uh, feel that there's very little coordination between key players and policy makers to support rural locations and their aspirations. And the question is, what can be done to make the strategic approach more coordinated and streamlined? Any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I, I, if you look at the, if you look at, at this sector, the whole marine tourism and recreation sector in Scotland 10 years ago, and you compare it to how we are now, um, we've come on leaps and bounds. And that's not to say that the work's all done, um, but we uh, started out, you know, well, I mean, the, the sector has been evolving, obviously, for a long time, but um, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't have the marine tourism strategy. We didn't have the Marine Scotland for a start. We didn't have the cross-party group on marine tourism and recreation. Um, there, there's so many joined up bits that are starting to happen and they've been evolving over the last sort of five years or so. I think we're moving in the right direction. And I think that it is you know that we need we need some more self-starters. We do need people to start bringing their own groups together and and coalescing around issues that are important to them, and then you know kind of letting everybody else know. And I'm not saying you let need to let us know. I'm saying that we're all part of this. Mm -hmm. We can all make our own networks, and it's about talking to each other. And I mean, there's the Western Isles Harbors Group, for example. If you you know it might be a good place for you to start um, getting in touch with with people like-minded individuals. Okay. We've pretty much been around the country, actually, um, and I think with the way time's running, uh, we're going to finish off with a question from Marion, who's in Mull, and she's interested in knowing if you see the results of the survey resulting in increased availability of funding in mar marine infrastructure and facilities. So that's yes. Yes. <laughs> in what ways, then? Oh, I, I mean, anybody who's allocating a budget wants an evidence base for that allocation. And that doesn't matter whether it's the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund or you know the, the money coming out of Europe that comes to Scotland or uh, whether it's Scottish Government or, or whoever. Everybody wants an evidence base and this is a pretty good evidence base. And when you link it up with all those other different evidence bases about social deprivation and rural communities and fragile communities and, and uh, changes in the fishing industry and all those sorts of things, you make a really comprehensive argument and the better that argument is the more <coughs> chance you have of securing that funding and I think that's why this probably will end up in, in money flowing to areas that need it. Okay. Yeah, for me this is a really important bit of the jigsaw. Yeah. Before we did this work there was quite good information about fishing, shipping, offshore renewables, those kind of Absolutely. things. But very little known about where activity takes place for recreation and tourism. So this by saying where it happens and how big it is yeah. raises the stakes, I think, and yeah. puts it on an equal status with those, those other things. Um, so it should stand on its own and I think, as you say, should, should support applications for investment at all different kind of scales. Okay. Well, we are almost out of time. Let's look at a couple of minutes left. And I know, Sarah, from your point of view, there was, there's some other work now being planned. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about that and, and where things might go next? Well, Lindsay Ross was supposed to be here today. Lindsay, if you're watching at home, I know she's not terribly well, so get well soon. Um, and Lindsay's from Marine Scotland and uh, would have been able to give us some more information about how the National Marine Plan is to be implemented and the work that they're doing there. So there's a little bit of a gap that I can't fill. 
but within the Clyde Marine Planning Partnership we're using, as I said earlier, we're using this information for the assessment of the Firth of Clyde and we will then be starting to uh, create policies on the basis of that main issues report and then policies on, on that. We'll be doing a lot of stakeholder engagement, a lot of community outreach to try and find out from people more, even more information about how they're using the sea, what they want to see happen in their marine area and then hopefully we can start planning for that to have this more kind of joined up cohesive sort of approach. Okay. So it's a, it's a really interesting time that, that we're in in terms of marine planning in Scotland. And if people want to get in touch with you, I think you said there's some changes to websites. Yeah. What was your advice for people getting in touch? Ju we're just about to launch a new website. So um, we will be the Clyde Marine Planning Partnership. Please put that into Google and you'll come to our website um, with the new one when it's launched. But you can still get in touch with me um, through the Clyde Forum website at the moment. Um, and I would also say that through Marine Scotland, Lindsay Ross is an excellent contact. Again, go straight into, I think it's lindsay.ross at scotland.gsi. Um, uh, and that will get through to Lindsay for the policy side of things. Um, and do feel free to drop us a line. We're more than happy to, to talk this through and, and to help people understand the report a bit better. Okay. I think Marine Scotland will be holding the data. Um, yeah. so they've got a website called the National Marine Planning Interactive, NMPI. I'm glad you mentioned that. Which has got all the GIS outputs from this work, so right. people can get, get hold of the maps. Okay. Um, and in due course, they might be able to get access to the raw data. Yeah. Uh, we need to work out some protocols for that. But very keen that it's out there and people can use it and make further use. Right. So the whole idea is it will be very accessible to Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Right, well, we have literally run out of time, so thanks to both of you for you. your time, time today and for answering the questions uh, from our, ge our, our guests. You're our guests from our audience, <laughs> was what I was trying to say, from our audience. And to you, the audience, thanks very much for joining us. You will find that there's uh, a various links underneath the window that I'm sitting in just now that you can click on that will take you through to the report and various other pieces of information around it if you haven't read all 400 pages yet then this is your opportunity to do that strike while the iron's hot so thank you very much for joining us today hope you found it informative and of course if you do want to get in touch with sarah she's told you exactly how to do that so thanks again and have a great afternoon